Welcome to School Talk. I'm Nadja Varney, your host. Is public education broken? Our schools have been going through a series of long-term so-called reform movements, some of which have tried to push public education into privatization or corporate uh, free market types of methods. Well, researchers, historians, teachers, and even the public are pushing back. And I'm delighted today to have a view from the teachers. I'm happy to in introduce to you the president of Massachusetts Teachers Association, Miss Mary Najimi. Welcome, Mary. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. This is such an important topic, especially to give teachers voice to tell the real narrative of what's happening in public schools. Well, just very briefly, how did you become interested in, in being part of a union? Yeah. I grew up in a union family, believe it or not. My grandparents were immigrants from Lebanon. My uncles were didn't finish beyond a high school education, and they got unionized factory jobs, which mm -hmm. gave them economic security. My father then went through the state college system in Massachusetts to get his degree in teaching, and he became a member of the Massachusetts Teachers Association. And on his salary, he was allowed, he was able to put three kids through state school and we came out debt free. So from a young age, I understood the value of unions. I hear you. It's interesting because my mom was one of the first, what they call the shop steward mm -hmm. at the old Abercrombie and Fitch in New York City. Mm. Um, a whole different world there. Not the new Abercrombie and Fitch. Mm -hmm. but the sporting department store for the wealthy. I didn't buy things there, but my mother was there mm, working. Mm -hmm. So the unions really from way back have affected your family and now to you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm asking now why did this idea come? Where did it take hold that public schools are broken? Yeah, that's such a central question. Our schools are not failing. They have been failed and they actually have been broke on purpose by legislators and corporations who have imposed on us a system that has three parts. Um, austerity budgets that starve a school and uh, punitive uh, evaluation system, uh, punitive accountability structures. And then you couple that with poverty and the ails of society. So the way the system works is you starve for decades a school district of its resources, and then you create um, a test and punish regime to, to paint a narrative that schools are failing, and they simply are not. And you no longer have the resources that you need in a school, nurses, librarians, mm -hmm. a robust art program, small class sizes, and students are living in poverty with food, food insecurity, ho housing insecurity. They come in with higher levels of trauma from gun violence, um, gang violence, family separation through incarceration or immigration raids. Like adults, kids cannot leave their problems at the door and come into school yes. ready to learn. I hear what you're saying, and yet they set up a whole testing system which was kind of at the root, I think, That's of right. all that you're talking about. Because they use tests to show that these schools should be punished, these teachers should be fired, and to change the whole view of public education. Right. Um, but with all these reforms, you would think everything would be hunky-dory. Mm -hmm. But there are still schools that are struggling. And I'm wondering, I, I could get from what you're saying that schools alone, schools doing this alone, mm -hmm. will not change things. But what do you see, um, you've mentioned some of the causes mm -hmm. of, of what, why schools were, why people were looking at putting it into privatization right. early on. But I'm wondering if you could tell me what you think uh, would be the, the primary uh, point that's causing schools to fail, as they like to say, failing. You, I like what you said, they're not failing, they're underscore underscoring is that what I think the phrase yes, you right use? when when we look at test scores to test, measure yes. a school the narrative becomes there's an achievement gap or yes. our students are underperforming there's a test score gap and our students are underscoring but we have to understand that the test itself and the accountability that goes with the test is by design a tool of privatization 
testing, mm. high stakes testing creates a racial hierarchy putting white students at the top and multiracial, multiethnic, multilingual students at the bottom. It is then used to level schools and the lower the, the, you drop in a level, the more consequences that a school district faces. And that means handing you over to a private receiver, um, putting you on a turnaround plan, or taking the school district and charterizing it. And it's, it's the charter school movement that is a for-profit movement designed to dismantle public education. This is, you must have read my mind because the very next thing I wanted mm -hmm. to ask you about mm -hmm. that grew out of all of this they w that was the charter school. That's right. But I'm wondering, from what I heard at the beginning, charter schools were not designed as they have become. Can you talk about that? What was the justification? What was the concept of the charter school? That Why was it picked up so? Mm -hmm. And what's happened to the charter school movement? Right. So the idea of a charter school was to bring creativity, innovation, even more autonomy to a district. A district that would run the charter school, and the charter school would still be have teachers under the teacher contract and overseen by the elected school committee, would create a charter. Maybe it becomes an arts school mm -hmm. or a science school. And teachers would be able to explore and and create a vibrant education within the charter of that school. Charter schools have now become, as I just said a few minutes ago, the weapon of privatization. I don't know uh, if you're aware that how much of a real estate transaction charter schools are actually now. There's a real estate. A real estate. One of the ways that, right, one of the ways that um, hedge fund investors benefit is there's something called a new market tax credit that is designed to encourage uh, development, particularly in low-income neighborhoods. Charter schools uh, operators, who are all majority now private venture capitalists, are able to qualify if they build a new charter school building in a low-income district under this new market tax credit, they are guaranteed 39% back on their returns in seven years. And we have to remember that the charter school movement is an anti-democratic movement. It takes public funds and it siphons them away from the public schools. It gives the funding to a private corporation to open up a charter school. Mm -hmm. The private corporation is an anti-democratic body because it's not elected by the town, and they have no accountability to the town for whatever happens this in the school. This is what drove me crazy. When I was talking with someone who really understood the charter school movement, and she kept saying, but they are public schools. Right. And I thought of the GI Bill, you know, where they had the money went with the GI, mm -hmm, whatever he wanted mm -hmm. to do when he came out of the Second World mm -hmm. War or whatever. And I thought, but every time a child walks out of the school, public money isn't the money following That's the child. That's right, it is. So what happens to the school when you've taken out, especially students who have the means right. to travel to a, a charter school? Right. And putting them, as you say now, that some of these hedge fund or corporation folks are building buildings in low-income areas, right. but um, doesn't that disrupt the public schools that are right in the area? It does two things, really. It, it, uh, it undermines the public schools in two ways. The only thing that's public about the charter school is they're taking public money, but nothing else about it is public. There's no accountability to the public. They do not even have a school committee, they do, do not. they? They do not. They have no body. They can do whatever they want. Right. How about enrollment? Are they forced? Because well, I heard they do not take as many children with learning disabilities. And so here's, this is the other way that they undermine. They both drain the brain power of the students who excel and entice them into the charter schools. And often they will, they may begin with a population of students who have special education needs and students from low income who have significant learning needs or social emotional needs. But usually, more often than not, the charter schools wind up counseling those students out back into the public schools after the deadline for when the money has to be returned. 
So it's a complete undermining Are of public education. Are you saying that a, a student, that a struggling student or someone with special needs is allowed in, so it looks very democratic That's and right. open, but there is this subtle, I mean, is there research to show that they kind of counsel these students back to the public school after they've received the money? Do they have to return the funds to the public school? By certain timelines, they have to return. But the common practice we hear over and over from charter school families who have left is that they were counseled out because it wasn't a good fit. Um, I would like to go back to what I think started all of this, and we spoke about it a few minutes mm -hmm. ago, the, the testing, mm -hmm. because it was not just testing, um, but what followed it. Um, I guess I'll ask it, I'll tell a quick anecdote and then ask the question. A friend of mine who I w had been teaching with her, she was an you know, experienced teacher, and she said, Najee, you won't believe this. I have to teach my entire second grade the same content, mm -hmm. and believe it or not, people walk in and out of our building to see if we're on the same page mm -hmm that is scripted for us to be on. She said, I sabotage it by afternoon. I break them up. I know one child is barely able to read a second grade book, and another one who can read a fourth or fifth grade and can have a much different curriculum. But this is what was happening, according to my friend, mm -hmm. in a public school. And that's what I want to talk about for a moment, and that is how this testing, not the high state testing yet. Testing in the general. The testing in general. That's right. And the other point you, I'd like to hear you speak to is um, what they did with test practicing. Because I had first grade teachers, too, friends, who said, my children were crying, mm -hmm, wetting mm -hmm. their pants, having a horrible time, but I had to force them through testing where some of them should have remained back in kindergarten mm -hmm, and had mm -hmm, no clue. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me how the testing was so accepted when ordinary classroom teachers could see the harm. Right, right. I, I first want to validate the story that you just told. Max Page, the vice president of the Massachusetts Teachers Association, and I are on the road at least three days a week visiting two or three locals a day. And we hear that story every time we meet with a teacher. I experienced that story. We were given in the Concord Public Schools where I am a kindergarten teacher on leave from, we were given a new math curriculum and we were told you must teach the curriculum with fidelity. And when I asked what that meant, that meant lesson by lesson, page by page. So there are two things that are linked. There's this movement, and again, this falls, this is what the accountability narrative looks like. There's the common core national standards mm -hmm. tied to testing. Now, I've been teaching for 28 years and I've taught everything from kindergarten to third grade. Kindergarten used to be the place where kids come in and learn how to be a student, learn how to socialize, solve problems through play, be creative and develop critical thinking in the block area and the art area and the sand table. In kindergarten today, mm -hmm. because of the Common Core and then the race to get to testing starting third grade, teacher after teacher tells me how they have to push out their sand table and pull in a reading table. This is now has a ripple effect that I'll be happy to talk about a little bit more after the break. Well, thank you. I didn't know that you knew we were going to a break, <laughs> but you knew, and I'm very happy that you were so that you could clinch that sentence just at the right point. Um, we will be back in just a moment. Hang with us. We've got a lot more to talk about. Because of you, I felt hopeless. Because you said rude things about my work, I started to question my own voice. I know it was a joke, but it still hurt me. Because of your negative comments online, I've almost quit doing the one thing that makes me happiest in life. Because you shared something about me that was private, I felt embarrassed. Because you said hi to me on the first day of school, I felt included and I knew that I was going to be okay. Because of you sharing your story with me, I feel comfortable sharing my own. Because you were there when I was coming out, you helped me regain my confidence. I'm still here today because of you. Mary, I am 
I hated to interrupt you there telling me the story that you were, mm -hmm. but I am very concerned about what's happening with small children right. in this country. Mm -hmm. I wonder if they even have a chance to be little children. And I know you've taught kindergarten, mm -hmm. and you know what's happening. You started to say how some of the teachers are sharing with you that they have to put in a reading table mm -hmm. instead of a sandbox. That's right. And what's taught, I know I'm visiting schools, and they're teaching what we used to teach in first grade That's right. in kindergarten. That's right. I don't know what's happened to the whole concept of readiness for learning mm -hmm. and intellectual development and cognition in small children. Right. And so would you like to expand a little more on that? Sure. Well, uh, so teacher after teacher will tell you kindergarten is the new first grade. So the Common Core and the testing movement has pushed down the curriculum and the content a grade below what it used to be. Mm -hmm. And there's less time for recess, less time for socializing, no time for kids going off on a tangent when something exciting happens. Um, teachers... It sounds, excuse me for interrupting, but isn't that how we learn, as Sizer said, to use your mind well? That's right. The purpose of school, when you just said going off on a tangent and expanding, that means learning new vocabulary, That's sharing right. vocabulary. Um, all that is being limited to what's on a script. Right. So the purpose of education used to be, and in my mind still is, to prepare students to learn how to think critically and creatively and be ready to be citizens in a democracy. The Common Core and High Stakes Testing has narrowed education down to the singular purpose of being college and career ready, and that is only one aspect of the reason of school. That's interesting to me because I think it was Jefferson who said to have a democracy one needs an educated citizen That's citizenry. Right. That's right. And um, education isn't, as you're pointing out, just I am ready for college, which means I have this content mm -hmm. and I pass the test. Right. So now I can go on. Right. Um, you're saying that we need far more concern for small children. We do. K kids need to develop who they are as human beings, learn how to interact with people around the world, self-discovery, self-identity, all of those things are gone. And in fact, in the Massachusetts Constitution, the, fa the framers of that Constitution wrote in it that knowledge and wisdom mm -hmm. are central to the preservation of rights and liberties. And therefore, they enshrined the importance of public education in the Massachusetts Constitution. Knowledge and wisdom. That's right. There you go. You can collect a lot of facts. I'm wondering if there's any connection here, this is a tangent, between the opioid problem with teenagers and slightly older. I heard a, a speaker once said, that we push these children and push them. It's like your, their pants are tight, but oh, right, they're not split yet. And right. tight pants, tight pants, mm -hmm. keep going, keep going until all of a sudden they're 16 and the pants rip. Right. You know, just as a, uh, an example mm -hmm. of what we put, the pressure we put That's on right. children. So We're, we are racing kids through their education, starting as early as preschool. Uh -huh. Um, we're, we're rushing through the curriculum so that we can get to the test. Kids are coming in with more social and emotional needs than ever before. Young children are less able to self-regulate their moods and their anxiety. And what we're seeing, it manifests itself later in what, what I like to call diseases of despair. Mm. Drug addiction, um, turning towards gangs, it's mm -hmm. when you are disconnected from a community, you, you have these diseases. School used to be about building community. Now it's putting kids on computers, getting them through the curriculum. Little, less and less are we spending more time to tend to the entire need of the child. And to make it even um, more serious, we hear about the achievement gap. Mm -hmm. Not only are all students going through this kind of actually reversing back to the factory model, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, putting them through all of this and giving them a paper to go on, but the achievement gap, and what does that mean to you today? It used to mean that people of color or poor people um, were not achieving on the tests as well as white students or right. students right. in 
um, higher income families. But lately, I hear referred more toward um, in terms of income, mm -hmm. low income and high. Now, what's happening with this whole concept of achievement well, gap? you know, it, it still is. When we talk about achievement, the test score is not the right way to measure a child. Uh, standardized testing still is fundamentally racially biased. So I don't call it an achievement gap. Like I said in the beginning of the show, it really is a test score gap. If we give teachers autonomy back to make decisions minute by minute, day by day, what happens in their classroom and how they come to, how, to know their students and evaluate their students, they would evaluate students of color with a different instrument. We would evaluate all of our students with multiple means and multiple measures. And when we only use one, it creates a false narrative mm. that our students of color and students from high levels of poverty are, are um, intellectually inferior. Mm. Which is um, totally incorrect. Yeah, that's it's an old racist proven. notion. Yes. Right. Um, and I'm thinking about uh, the students when we were able back a long time ago now for me, but when we were able to do individualized testing is mm -hmm. what we called it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, as the reading supervisor, would teach the regular right. classroom teachers how to do individualized reading um, testing one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. before we would give out the mm -hmm. book and the curriculum right. to see what the children were interested in, what their skills are, and as one of our superintendents used to say, we need skills, but we need thrills. Mm -hmm. And that's what we tried to provide. And why that was taken away from the hands of teachers, um, I'm wondering if it's because, as you said, we're no longer dealing with pedagogy. We're that's dealing right. with tests. Right. Um, is that what, would you elaborate on that a little sure. bit? Sure. It used to be that pedagogy inf drove our instruction and our teaching practices and what and how we would teach. Now, pedagogy has been removed from the equation and standards drive what we teach, how we teach, for how long and when. But we have to go back to pedagogy. We have to go back to a pedagogy that assumes students come with knowledge and they will build their knowledge and deepen their knowledge by interacting with materials, by interacting with human beings, each other, by asking questions, and most critically, by given time in a day to reflect on what they've learned, reflect on their mistakes, and mm -hmm. ask themselves, how do I move forward and correct my mistakes? There's no time for that in the day mm -hmm. anymore. Now, w with the schools that are identified as poor performing mm -hmm. or um, part of this achievement gap, mm -hmm. what have, you mentioned early on at the beginning some remedies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you elaborate a little on that? What would you do to help the school other than punish them and fire the teachers, right, which right. is what they're doing I now? Think, right. I think there's two central things that have to be done across the country. We have to fully fund public education. We have to get rid of the strategy of austerity. So when we have the funds that we need, we will have small class sizes, a school nurse in every building, aides, paraprofessionals in the classroom to help teach reading and writing, robust arts program, full-time librarians, a mental health team. That's the first part of the equation. The second part of the equation is Americans trust their teachers. So teachers' autonomy has to be restored to them. Teachers need to be given the respect and dignity that they are the experts and they should be determining what gets taught how it gets taught, when, for how long, and how they assess their students. Now, someone might say, well, a, a new teacher really is not prepared to mm -hmm. make such huge decisions. Mm -hmm. How would you deal with that within a school? So, but the nature of educators is that we are collaborators and Collaboration. we are right, community builders. Veteran teachers the, it, have a critical role in both formally and informally mentoring new teachers. And veteran teachers have a lot to learn from new teachers. So when you build a collaborative relationship, then you have a high functioning team working in your schools. Mm -hmm. This makes a great deal of sense to me, but things are so different today. There's mm -hmm. this growing dependence on technology. Mm -hmm. And now there's this push 
I thought I would think when I saw the front of a, a magazine with a child in kindergarten mm -hmm. on a computer, and they were hailing the fact that they <laughs> were putting computers in the hands right. of right. four and five year olds right. as a way to teach. Some people are calling it personalized mm -hmm. learning mm -hmm. now. What's your view on that? Yeah. So personalized learning is a misnomer. Personalized learning is what you spoke about earlier. When the teacher gets to know the interests of the child, you referenced it when you talked about the inventory where you get to know what kids like to read and how they read. And then uh, we adapt. We are Educators are constantly adapting to how students are responding. Let me speak specifically about the technology. Again, it goes back to pedagogy. There are benefits and dangers to technology. When, how you use technology in the classroom has to be grounded in a pedagogy. Are we raising citizens or consumers? Mm -hmm. And what you just said kind of um, reminded me that we have to be careful with the use of technology. We have just a few seconds left. Very quickly, in a sentence or two, do you feel, what are your frustrations or your positive feeling for tomorrow in education? So as the president of the largest teachers union in, in Massachusetts, yes. I feel very hopeful because teachers are at the point where they want to reclaim public education and they are supported by the community. The, the residents, the voters in this country believe in educators, and that's how we're going to reclaim public education. It's community and collaboration. That's right. From the grassroots, right. here you are, a union gal. That's right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mary and Jimmy. My pleasure. I appreciate it. And I'll turn to our viewers and say, I think I'll end with a quote from the president of the National Education Association. She wrote, Reversing the chronic neglect of the nation's school system and the damage that blaming teachers first has had, it may take a few years, she writes, but the public is on our side. And by the way, the conversation will continue here on School Talk.